So to the second half of our overview, uh, where we left off was uh, the three different uh, types of chord and their qualities, major, minor, and seventh, major being happy, contented, minor being somber, sad, serious, and seventh being anxious, wanting to move somewhere. We also saw that the three types of music theory I'm expressing here each seem to have one of those qualities. In other words, the original Greek uh, theory, because the five chord could move to the one major chord, uh, basically that's a major bass system in a sense, if you stretch your thinking a little bit. Uh, when the major minor key system came along, now we have the tweaking of the Aeolian scale uh, uh, by raising the first step, uh, uh, the uh, seventh step, and finally the sixth step later on. Uh, this tweakery with the minor scale uh, is the main thing that happened after temperament, like the main set of changes that went on. The major scale wasn't affected that much by, uh, by the temperament, but the minor scale was. So you could say the second form of theory emphasized the minor chord. So the first Greek emphasizes major, the second major minor key system emphasize, emphasizes minor, and finally the American system, which is blues, emphasizes the seventh chord. Interesting to think that that might have been a progression of history, the three types of chord and involvement through those. Um, all right, so when you think of music as being a mirror of the society we live in, it basically reflects back to us what we're like. When you think of the 60s, the emphasis was on blues, and that means the seventh chord as the rooted one chord, the tonic chord, which was never before done in classical days. It was not accepted that way. Uh, they might have experimented a little uh, during the Impressionist period and such, but it wasn't out overtly stated the way it is in blues. Um, Basically, we have this anxious chord, and we're looking at a society that was in a state of anxiety. When we look at uh, the involvement of the blues in the 60s and what was actually going on in the 60s, they were very, very tumultuous times. Um, I think maybe today, as tumultuous as things are getting, uh, may come close to what it was like back then. Uh, I think it was even more intense. Um, but, you know, who knows where we're going at this point. Uh, in any case, you know, if you uh, look at the summer of 1967, that was the summer of love. Now we go to 2017, and it's the summer of hate is going on, which uh, really saddens me because I was brought up with the message of love and that music should help people to open up and have a good time and enjoy themselves and unify with each other rather than argue with each other about political fine points. Uh, it has to be stated here that all of American music is African American music. Um, you could, there are some Irish influences in the folk music of the Appalachians, but even that got affected by blues. When you say the word blue grass, well the grass is the country music, the blue part of it comes from the blues. And yes, indeed, in bluegrass music they do uh, employ the blue note, uh, which is one of the uh, earmarks of blues playing. Uh, so, uh, you know, we go back in history now and uh, we look and see that from blues sprung jazz. Jazz was birthed from the blues. And later on down the years, the blues kind of reset itself and uh, from that sprung rock and roll, what we call rock and roll, which eventually became rock. It lost the roll part of it, which uh, is kind of a sad loss when you think about it. Rock and roll was just fun, it was rebellious, and it was just kids enjoying themselves. Uh, in any case, we go back to jazz, the early days of jazz. Well, jazz was a very attractive form. It was new, it had rhythm, it, it was fun, and basically that became the pop music of the day. Then jazz became more and more sophisticated and elevated and refined and complex. And what happened is the musicians that weren't heavy intellectuals or complete nerds about music were left in the dust with jazz. By the time they got to bebop, you had to be a great musician to play bebop. You couldn't be a basic player. So what had happened was the, the blues kind of reset itself and said, well, we're not going to do that, but we're going to work with the blues some more. And then along comes Ch uh, Chuck Berry in a historical moment, 
and he shows up at the uh, Chess Records label to audition, and there's Leonard Chess standing there with Muddy Waters, and Chuck Berry is indeed playing the blues, but at three times the speed, he's rocking it, and there's a moment in the movie uh, Standing in the Shadows of, uh, no, uh, Cadillac Records, there's a moment in that movie where uh, Muddy Waters is watching He's standing next to Leonard Chess and he's watching Chuck Berry and he leans into Leonard Chess and goes, I don't know what that is. And Leonard Chess leans into Muddy Water and says, I don't know what it is either, but we're going to make a record out of it. And that moment was history. Rock and roll sprung from possibly just that moment. So uh, there you go. I mean, uh, so, uh, but going back to, to, uh, to the inception of rock and roll, uh, so rock and roll happens early 60s, late 50s. Then you have the Brits are tuning into American rock and roll going, this is a shite. I love this stuff. So they start retooling their own music to sound like American music. Um, but it didn't. It didn't sound like authentic blues or authentic rock and roll. They did their best. You know, Paul McCartney got a lesson from, uh, from uh, what's his name? Uh, Oh God, I can't, can't remember the singer's name right now, but how to do the woo, Little Richard. <laughs> Little Richard gave him a lesson in how to do that. And you know, the black musicians were actually giving the white guys a thumbs up, like, hey, you're doing our music really well. Um, the difference here though, is when we look at the progression of jazz, which was birthed from the blues, we see that it's elevated to this high art form and it's revered as being a sophisticated art. But then when you look at rock and roll and how it progressed through the 60s and 70s, it's considered lowbrow music. It's not important to music history. Well, that's not true. There were great, great composers of the 60s, and because of the psychedelic influence, LSD was going around like water in those days, and the composers were influenced it in terms of the musical sound. They were generating modulations within songs, great chord progressions. Um, some of the um, industry composers, Carol King started out as an industry composer. She wrote great music. Um, Boyce and Hart, uh, one of the uh, songwriting teams behind the Monkees, they were great songwriters. The Monkees also had uh, Neil Diamond as a, as a songwriter. He was also an excellent songwriter. Um, and the list goes on. I mean, uh, Jim Webb was an, was an industry composer. He composed for uh, a lot of Glenn Campbell songs he did, and he did um, The Fifth Dimension's Up, Up, and Away, which is a marvel of modulation and chord movement. This is something that's completely missing in today's music. There is no modulation. It's just boring. Uh, no, no more adventuresome looking into sounds. In any case, my point being that um, the compositions of the 60s and 70s need to be elevated to the same level that jazz was elevated to. These are great, great compositions. Yes, it's not so much an improvisational art form. There's some, I mean, you know, always there's the electric guitar improvs. But basically, it's more about the, the composition, how the song is architectured, that sort of thing. So uh, part of my job, my point, is to elevate that music to where it belongs. And I'll be doing a lot of analysis of 60s and 70s music. So we find in the 60s, um, three strong influences. And uh, those would be the American black composers, which would be Motown and other areas uh, in the States. Um, the other big influence would be the British invasion, which is the retooling of American rock and roll and blues. And finally, an unexpected element is in a little area of New York City, Greenwich Village, sprang the whole folk uh, music revolution. And at first these guys were, they thought themselves as like the intelli intelligentsia, the cream of the crop intellectually, um, which was kind of snotty on their part, but they would put down rock and roll as being for the kids and they didn't have a political message so it wasn't important, we're deep, they're not, type of thing. And a lot, but these guys actually weren't very creative. They were just reconstituting old folk songs from people like Woody Guthrie. But along came Bob Dylan, like St. John of the Desert, comes from out of nowhere, and he's the guy, he's writing his own music, and his lyrics and poetry are just over the top, incredible. The guy's clearly a genius and an enigma at the same time. So we have this third element of folk music uh, 
coming into the fore. These three elements, American black music, British uh, rock and roll, and American folk music, all blend, began to blend together over time. One influenced the other, influenced the other. I've heard uh, songs from Motown where the lead singer is influenced by Dylan with that ooh kind of thing he does. Um, uh, Bob Dylan was influenced by the Beatles. The Beatles were in turn influenced by Bob Dylan. Uh, you know, in the early days, the Beatles thought you could only write love songs. Then they heard Dylan and realized you can write any kind of song about anything. And it could be completely abstract. Um, so in any case, uh, these three influences are what kind of crossbred and interbred. And we have this incredible bouquet of music that came out of the 60s and became refined in the 70s. And they, they kind of crossed over with each other, as I said. And some of it became so sophisticated that it did enter the realm of jazz sophistication. Uh, for example, the music of Steely Dan or Earth, Wind & Fire. Or you take a folk artist like Joni Mitchell, her music became so sophisticated that only jazz players can do it with her because the other musicians couldn't keep up. I have a buddy, he was a session player in New York City in the 60s. In fact, he was Bob Dylan's uh, acoustic guitar session man. Uh, Bruce Langhorn, may he rest in peace. He, um, uh, he was, Joni Mitchell called him up one time and wanted him to play on her record and flew out to Minnesota to meet her and um, he said, Joni, this stuff is too intense. I, I, can't, I can't cut it. And this was a sophisticated uh, guitar player. He was a great, great guitar player, but he couldn't get what Joni was doing. So there's uh, a kind of refinement in the 70s that happened. So I'm going to be going over and explaining a lot of the concepts, including modulations, secondary dominant chords, tritone substitution, plus radical ideas that you wouldn't hear in music school. For example, did you know that there's such thing as a minor dominant chord? Well, there is, and I can prove it. All right. I'm going to correct the problems with chord naming, which is about 80% correct, but if we complete the system, we'll have exact, precise chord naming. And in fact, what they call a 13th chord, there's no such thing. You can either have uh, G9 add 13 or G7 add 13, but there is no such thing as a standalone G13 chord according to the way it should be done. And when I explain it, you'll see what I mean. So in any case, I'm hoping you're enjoying this so far, and uh, I'll see you with the next installment. Take care and be well, YouTubers.